Hello, I am Jarmo Eskelinen. I am the CEO of Forum Virium Helsinki. We are an uh, innovation company, or maybe you could say uh, entrepreneur company based in the city of Helsinki, innovation arm of the city. And what we do is to create new digital service innovations in a PPPP, public-private people partnerships. Our activities are based on a membership model. So we do have a group of companies from uh, big to small in uh, business sectors, especially such as ICT, telecommunications and some in service industries. Then we have a group of public sector bodies, most importantly the city of Helsinki, which is our key stakeholder, and a couple of international networks about which I'll talk more about later. We work in focus areas. And today I am going to concentrate in one of the focus areas, which is the smart city sector. We also do have an extensive portfolio of project in uh, well-being. And then the uh, common theme to all our projects, which is the user of innovation and living labs. Which brings us to the living labs. I am also currently the chairman and president of the European Network of Living Labs. We are an international organization of 320 living lab actors in all continents. So maybe we should drop the European from the network name even. What's common with these organizations, which are based in cities, universities, research units and also companies, is that we believe that services should be developed in collaboration with the people, with the actual users, from the development to testing and validating and to the final product, all through the development pipeline. But since the topic of the day is actually city, it would be good to ask what makes a city. I used to be an architect a couple of decades back before I dwindled in, the, uh, in ICT and never was able to go back to architecture. But I still love the city and it would be very tempting for me to say that city is about buildings, about great physical infrastructure. But one could also argue that cities are about trade, about goods and money going back and forth. Because cities are often established along these routes of, of trade and commerce and goods. But even more fundamentally, the city of tomorrow will not be the same as the city of today. Cities are very much about change. If you take New York, any city, the only thing you know about the future of that city is that it will be, not will be the same city as it is today. And this makes developing city services a challenging task because it's very hard to define, for example, an operating system or a user interface to something which is in a constant flux, constant state of change. So city systems must be very fault tolerant and very robust to these changes. But I think the most important fa fact is that cities consist of people. So if there's no people, there is no city. So anything the city does depends on how we as citizens behave in the city. If we want to have a sustainable city, we can design however clever energy systems or transport systems or efficient buildings. But at least one half, maybe even more of how sustainable a city is depends on how, how we as people, as citizens, use the city, how we live in the city. Because we are very good at surprising the designers. This is not quite the biggest traffic jam in the world. I don't have the picture of that. This is from LA and this was only one day, but it's pretty impressive. But the biggest one was in China in Beijing. And that was four and a half days and 200 kilometers long. And it's, it is not what the Chinese had planned when they built a very big highway. So we people are very good at making a chaos of the city and doing something very different from what the designers had in mind. And basically city is in a, follows the law of entropy and tries to really step into a state of unorganized mess 
at all points of its existence. And the ones we should work with to solve those problems are the people who are causing them in the first place. And luckily, communities are created. So we people are quite good at solving the problems we have created. And that is the nature of innovation, really, if we think of it. Uh, if we take sectors such as sports, most things we do in sports, new innovations, are actually user innovations. Skateboards, mountain bikes, downhill skiing, they are not designed by a company or one inventor. They are designed by devoted skiers and bikers and skateboarders. And then later capitalized by companies and developed further. And it's impossible to develop new innovation in these sectors without collaborating with the communities. The same is true in culture, very much so. There's no culture without things done previously by, by ancestors. Ramones, Ramones didn't invent punk rock. Chuck Berry didn't invent rock and roll. Sibelius didn't invent romantic classical music. It's in all areas of culture we built on the shoulders of our ancestors. Literature or visual arts or music. That's the way people do things. What is different today maybe then compared to the way people have always done things is that now it's quicker to bring together the like-minded people to work with us. So we can use users as innovators, as our peers. One good example of this is the hotel and restaurant business in which ever since the 80s and or 70s, I think, uh, most of the new innovations come from the field. They are very good at listening to what their customers have to say, what waiters have to say, receptionists, cleaning ladies. Could same be used in healthcare? And even more fundamentally, when we take these smart tools into use, we can use users as contributors to actually do the thing we are doing. Great example of this is the open source community in which very big complex entities are created in unison by a devoted community working together. So can we use these models to transform our cities and societies? We do have the tools because we have reached the sweet point where the smart technologies are in everyday use by the majority. My mother is using a smartphone, so it's not technological, technologically very challenging anymore. And what's interesting is that, as Clay Shirk has put it, when things become technologically boring, they become socially interesting because the big majority adapts technologies and they transform the societies. So, can we use the power of the communities to change our cities? Can we use, if we take an example from Wikipedia, can they use this power for our benefit? This is a picture of the Wikipedia, of English version only. There are a couple of dozens of other, other languages also. And that's only half of it. It would be 1723 books if it would be printed now. And the question, which publishing house could have done this work, published this book? The answer is, of course, none. No company in the world could have afforded to do it, yet it was done. So communities are actually able to create things which are utterly impossible in any other way. So a very big transformative power we are talking about. And can we now bring this internet model of innovation, the horizontal model, for, real, for the real world needs? Can we bring the people to collaborate with us in the cities using these kind of ways? Now, if we want to do it, there are a couple of things we need to understand. First is that all this efficiency is based on, is based on horizontal collaboration, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. That's the power of the, of the web. Second, the way we work in the web must be very flexible in concepts in business models. For example, Flickr used to be a gaming platform before it was turned into a photo sharing platform by the de developers when they noticed that, just a second, this is how people are using the service. And most importantly, all successful business models in the internet, anything which has become really popular, is based on radically open models of collaboration. 
take for example Google. I remember when Google, Google, Google came, uh, they were ridic ridiculed publicly that, you know, there's no way they can make money out of it because the search is free, so it will go bankrupt in two years. Where are we now? So if the cities want to step into this rearm, they must see themselves as enablers, opening themselves to collaboration with the, com with the communities. There are some things which the cities will own and, de and invest, define, but there's lots of other things happening in the city, which the city must be aware of. There are things city can monitor and decide, just a second, that's good. We don't have to do that anymore. We can let the market do it. Or we can drive and nurture this particular service created in the city. So the city should be in constant dialogue between these different corners of practitioners, things which they own and drive, things which they monitor, and things which they nurture and support, even though they are not provided by the city or by the public entity. In practice, these enablers are different. One of the most important enablers is data, access to da data. Public sector creates lots of data, maps, geospatial information, environmental data, budgets, weather data, data about transport, real-time data about about different activities in the city, about logistics, you name it. I mean, there's really much material which the public sector uses, which is very valuable, but it's not currently used. Not even by the public sector itself, because data is mostly locked away in vaults which are unaccessible to other parties except the data creator in the first place. And the uh, the point of data, like all information, is that if you share the data, it becomes more valuable. So, how can we as cities do this? We must have a process for opening the data. It's actually a pretty cumbersome job. So, we must have a clearinghouse model to find the data, harmonize the data, publish the data and use the data and use the communities, help the communities in using the data. And here's an example of from Helsinki, the Helsinki op Open Data Clearinghouse, Helsinki Region InfoShare, which does exactly that. It's an open data task force helping the public entity and the data users to better utilize the data. When that's done, what we get are innovations. Here's an example called Parkman. It's a private company, already Scandinavian, going fast, going abroad. And what it gives you is a single click parking. You drive in a city, you park your car somewhere, you push a button you have parked, you do whatever you do, you come back to the car, you push the button again and you have unparked. Everything else happens in the background. So you don't have to care about parking zones or paying. It's all done through open data channels in the background. The next thing we get is efficiency. Here's an example again from Helsinki the City of Helsinki service map. That's a map-based interface to everything, all the services in the city. And when we did that, we find, found 19 different map-based services in the city, which were all underfunded and underused. And they didn't know that the other 18 exist. When we pulled the resources together, we got a better service for a cheaper price. And last and very importantly, open data gives you more, or more eyes to work and look at the government. So it gives us transparency. It makes public decision making better understandable and therefore more accessible to the people. Here's an example of the budget tree, which transforms the budget of a government into a tree format, which is very easy to understand. The thicker the branch, the bigger the money which goes into that, into that particular topic. So it turns thousands and thousands of rows of Excel sheets into very in under, easy to understand visual format. But unfortunately, no matter how much the cities or governments open the data, we are not there yet if we do it on a city to city or one country on one country basis, because the whole point of internet innovation is scale. The more users we have, the better the service will be. And a one city service or one country service in the digital domain, it will be a small service, no matter how big a country 
or city we have. And things become very interesting for the developers if they can get a promise that when I design a good service for Nairobi, it will actually run also in Paris or Mumbai. So interoperability is the key question here. And nobody ever designed the city to be interoperable. So it's actually a quite hard task because we have the existing legacy of the cities. And the way to do the interoperability is to do a two-way flow. So we need the decision making of the cities, the top level to be involved. But actually as a job, it's too big a job to be managed by the public sector itself. We need the community power to work with us in the harmonization process in a true internet fashion. And we have an example of this here, which is the city service development kit. And that's a process we have started now with eight European cities from Helsinki to Istanbul and Lisbon. And we do exactly that. We harmonize service interfaces to free service sectors of the city. Smart participation, feedback, smart mobility, transport systems, and smart tourism, for example, multilingual interfaces to the city. And what we do is that we harmonize the back end of the service and create the interface to the back end. So we don't do just one service for feedback or mobility or tourism. We create the opportunity for all stakeholders to do their own services. If the Cycling Association of Amsterdam wants to create a very good cycling feedback app, they can do it. If they follow the interface, the Amsterdam city will hear. If the local community in Istanbul wants to develop a good uh, mobility app for their own area, they can do it. And if it follows the interface, it will work together with the city of Istanbul systems. So not one service, umpteen services, but one interface. That's the key here. And the more cities we have involved, the better this will work. So take this as an invitation. So. Uh, to wrap up, first, we must trust the communities if we want to succeed in city innovations. Because communities are the ones which turn the city into chaos, but they are also the ones which are creative partners for us. Second, cities are organisms. So city systems must be fault tolerant and robust. Because otherwise, we don't have a chance of success. We can do this by using internet innovation models for real world needs, being open, being flexible, and using the horizontal collaboration of different stakeholders. When we do this, we must have a two way model to build the processes. We must have the top-down involvement, the, the actual buy-in in the government, but we can't succeed if we don't have the grassroots up, bottom-up level to work with, together with us. Because nobody designed the cities to be interoperable. So when we want to make them interoperable, we must actually have more resources that the public sector is, itself can bring here. We must have the developers, the citizens and developer communities to harmonize the interfaces and the, and the data with us. And last, and very importantly, governments should not see themselves as sole providers of the service, but as enablers of service creation. Enablers of service creation. So that the city follows and monitors what happens in the city, nurtures some services, Stops, do, stops doing something, which it used to do because it's done by the market, and gives the room, gives the space for city innovations to be created by the companies in the city, big and small, and by the co communities in the city, big and small also. So, I conclude with that. Remember, governments and cities are enablers of innovation. Thank you.